Good afternoon. I'm Steve Pushes. I'm a second year graduate student at UChicago Booth and one of the graduate chairs on the Institute of Politics Student Advisory Board. My connection to the disability community is through my immediate family, co-founding the Brink Election Guide, and through supporting Opportunity Knox, a Chicagoland nonprofit enriching the lives of those with developmental disabilities. We have an exciting conversation on TAP, focused on accessibility, disability rights, and activism. We've paired together a leading filmmaker and a leading journalist who have both, been, who have both spent their careers elevating human rights and disability issues. First, we have Nicole Newnham, an Emmy award-winning documentary producer and director. She's a five-time Sundance Film Festival alum and a five-time Emmy nominee. Nicole has a history of highlighting activism and human rights issues through her films. She was nominated for an Emmy in directing and producing the documentary Sentenced Home, which follows three Cambodian refugees in Seattle who were deported back to Cambodia after 9-11. Nicole co-directed and produced Revolutionary Optimists, a globally screened film that followed a group of young activists in the slums of Kolkata. More recently, and why we are so excited to have her speak today, is Nicole co-directed Crip Camp, which was nominated for Best Documentary at the 93rd Academy Awards and won the Audience Award at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. Next, we have Liz Plank. Liz is an award-winning journalist, author, and executive producer, and the host of several critically acclaimed shows on Vox and NBC News. Liz is the CEO of Liz Plank Productions, is a columnist on MSNBC, and regularly appears on national networks to provide perspective on gender, disability, and human rights. She is a Forbes 30 Under 30 recipient, and through her activism and creative approach to journalism, Liz has made it her mission to elevate the voices of those who are not often heard. She's incredibly active on social media and is absolutely worth the follow. I promise you that her post will brighten your day. We're so excited to have Nicole and Liz speak today. And with that, we'll show a brief clip from Crip Camp uh, in just a moment. What, you want me to tell them what happened? Well, two people got cramps and they were spreading. We were all very hyper about it. And I have to go shower some people. I'll see you later. I wanted to be part of the world, but I didn't see anyone like me in it. I hear about a summer camp for the handicapped run by hippies. Somebody said you probably will smoke dope with the counselors. And I'm like, sign me up. <laughs> Have to catch Jeanette and find yourself. There I was. I was at Woodstock. You wouldn't be picked to be on the team back home, but at Jeanette, you had to go up the back. Even when we were that young, we helped empower each other. It was allowing us to recognize that the status quo is not what it needed to be. The world always wants us dead. We live with that reality. At the time, so many kids just like me were being sent to institutions. It was just a continual struggle. Most disabled people, like myself, are unable to use public transportation. We needed a civil rights law of our own. A rehabilitation program has been vetoed by the president because it was cost prohibitive. We decided we were going to have a demonstration. You get the call to action to the barricades. A small army of the handicapped have occupied this building for the past 11 days. So many people from Camp Jeanette found their way into the building. The FBI cut off the phones. The deaf people went, we know what to do. That's how we communicated to the people outside the building. The Black Panther Party, we bring a hot meal. We were like this. We are the strongest political force in this country. We will no longer allow the government to oppress disabled individuals. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. What we saw at that camp was that our lives could be better. <laughs> You don't demand what you believe in for yourself. You're not going to get it. I said you like to see um, handicapped people depicted as people. Excuse me? Hi. Whoa. I got goosebumps, even though <laughs> I've seen it so many times. And 
Um, you know, it's just, it's just such a great film. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us, Nicole, to um, talk to us about what a journey it was um, to create this, this film and, and how just completely crucial it is um, for, for everyone to see it. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you, Nicole, how did this project even sort of come about? I know that you and Jim were not necessarily involved at the beginning, uh, but the, you brought Jim on to do the film with you. How, how did you even uncover Camp Jeanette? Well, it actually really did start with Jim and it, it started, I'm sorry, Jim can't join us today, yeah. but, um, but uh, Jim is my uh, longtime friend and colleague. He started a um, documentary mixing company in Berkeley and about 25 years ago now, um, I brought an early documentary project of mine to him right when he opened his doors. And I had heard that he was from the Berkeley Repertory Theater and he was a great sound mixer. And I walk in and he's, you know, uh, wearing a tie-dyed shirt and a reggae beret. And we had a fantastic time. Uh, he did an incredible job mixing our film, was really passionate about documentary as a medium for social change. And the two of us just struck up a friendship. So I kept bringing my films to him over the years. And every time I would come in and spend a few weeks in the studio with him, I would learn about disability rights. And I learned about disability as a community and disability as a culture. And it became very fascinating to me, as did his quest to try to make filmmaking accessible for people with disabilities. So I'd come in and he'd be like writing an email to Sundance because, you know, the filmmaker's lodge was up three flights of stairs and he was going with films that he had mixed and he couldn't get up to see panel discussions about those films. And people were saying, well, you know, that's OK, we'll just um, pipe in the, um, the panels to an, a location down the street, you know. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, once it, it was that kind of shift for me, even though I grew up in a, a family, you know, the disability was a big part of I just still didn't really see disability as a civil rights issue until I came to know Jim well. So, you know, about six years ago, he took me out to lunch when I finished a project and said, you seem like the kind of filmmaker who might be able to make the kinds of films that I wish I was seeing about disability, but that I never see. And he pitched me a few ideas and they were kind of interesting. And on the way back to um, the parking lot, he said, but you know, Nicole, what I've really always wanted to see is a film about my summer camp. And I said, why? And he starts describing Camp Jeanette. And I just realized as he's painting a picture of it for me, you know, with the hippie folks and the, you know, pot smoking and the sort of you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll of it all, like right in the kind of heyday of the 70s, that I'm it's shifting the way I think about disability, even as he's just describing it. And then he sent me some photographs and I was like, oh my God, like it really was like that. It wasn't just his romantic right. memory, of it, you know? <laughs> it felt like discovering this like lost utopia from the past that would be something that we would wanna strive for in the future, which was so intense. And then he said, I have this theory that there's something that connects those kids that had that liberatory experience at that camp and came out to California with the movement that came later. And I knew a little bit about the 504 sit-in and everything, but when I started reading about it, I got so excited. Like, could we really mm. kind of turn back time and see the origin of that movement through these young people? But we didn't have access to the footage yet. We were, so we were thinking about hiring, you know, young actors with disabilities and, recreating scenes. And so, um, so it sort of, you know, evolved, but I guess the, the, the big turning point that kind of turned it into a real project was, um, was me kind of thinking about like, is this, this is an incredible story, but it feels like it's not really my story. It feels like the really powerful thing would be if, you know, it could be co-directed by Jim and kind of come from his personal point of view. And so I asked him if he would direct it with me and, um, instead of him producing and me directing. And then, and that's when we started really um, moving forward with it. Wow. It's always the last thing. Like it's all, you know, you have all the prepared ideas, but then you're like, but what I really like to do is this thing that's crazy. Right. Or, or is uh, new, no one would be interested in, or it's just interesting to me. Uh, it's always those passion projects that are usually, I've had so many meetings like that 
you know, in, in, in producing as, as well, where it's like, okay, well, there's this thing that I think, you know, would be about something that's relevant in the news or something that people <laughs> care about. What I'd really love to do is this. And then, so anyway, if there's anyone listening, uh, I'm sure this is not the only project where this has happened to you too. We're just really following what you're most passionate about just makes the best film. Um, so, yeah. so I want to uh, talk about so many things. For, you mentioned the 504 sitting. Sit, well, let's talk about Camp Jeanette. For people yeah. who may not have, uh, you know, come around to, they're going to see it right after this, but have not necessarily seen the movie. What, it, what was Camp Jeanette? I mean, Camp Jeanette was this ramshackle camp in the Catskills that had been started by a couple of, uh, you know, Jewish sisters back in the 50s to be uh, a camp, a summer camp that, um, you know, for for handicapped youth. Um, but it kind of came out of a tradition of summer camps in the Catskills that were for for Jewish kids. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was really this um, uh, knowledge and kind of understanding that for communities of people who were facing discrimination and weren't kind of necessarily like let into all the social clubs or whatever, that these kinds of utopian communities where people's, you know, um, shared a kind of a culture and an identity, that that could be a really powerful and transformational. I mean, this is something that Denise Jacobson, who's in our film, told me when we first reached out to her. She said, I think that's one of the reasons why Jeanette was so special. And then it came into the hands of this guy, Larry Allison, who had actually like been at a bar at one time. Um, and this uh, disabled adult man came in and tried to order a beer and the bartender wouldn't let him have a beer. And Larry was so outraged by it that he started thinking about disability rights. And then he took a job running this summer camp and he was completely steeped in this sort of like let's completely reinvent society, let's be intentional, let's do it together, you know, in a collaborative, cooperative way. So we hired a staff and they set about to say, like, if we were going to really achieve kind of equity for people with disabilities, what kind of camp and what kind of community would we want to have? And they basically built it, you know. Um, so it became a haven for so many people who would go on to become activists because what they found in that community was... Um, a way to look at their common experiences of oppression and identify that the problems they were facing were societal problems, not their problems. And that was just really transformational. And of course, Judy Human showed up there and became a counselor. And that that's sort of what, you know, changed history, I think. Who is Judy Human? For those who, you know, have been unfortunately educated in, in a curriculum where disability rights is often completely erased or ignored. Um, yeah, who, I mean, we see her a lot in the trailer and she's a true American hero who changed the course of history. Uh, but tell us, tell us about uh, Judy. Yeah, I do. I think Judy is one of the great civil rights leaders in, in probably in world history, you know, because mm -hmm. she, she really did um, figurehead the disability rights movement in a really critical way. And the fact that she did it as a woman and as a, as a disabled woman, you know, facing multiple kinds of um, oppression is really um, extraordinary. Uh, but she she had basically um, she was a, a young woman, um, you know, from Brooklyn, and uh, she had uh, her parents were Holocaust survivors and they were um, real activists on her behalf. And they taught her to if you saw injustice, you know speak up loudly mm -hmm. and um, and just keep keep saying no, you know, until you get what's right. And she decided she wanted to be a teacher and she was discriminated against by people who they gave her, you know, sort of a test to see it, to pass her teaching exam. And they determined that because of her disability, she might be a, a, a fire hazard um, and they wouldn't let her teach. Um, she was denied an education as a child and she fought back against all these things. Um, she won, she sued New York and she won the right to teach. And then she founded Disabled in Action, which was an early disability rights organization in New York that a lot of the Camp Gen Ed folks, you know, uh, found their way to and joined. And, and they were the ones who um, pushed together um, to get the 504 um, legislation um, written and then eventually, you know, enacted. But but Judy, one of Judy's, you know, one of the most exciting things about Judy is that she understood very early on, like in elementary school, as we show in the film, 
that that people found power by coming together across mm-hmm. really diverse experiences and, and different disabilities. Um, but that when people um, were able to kind of understand that what somebody else needed um, in order uh, to live a full life, mm-hmm. and just basically have the, the widest tent possible, um, that there was political power in that. So true. Um, I, we, when we uh, talked, I, I, I told you this, but, but yeah, I worked at a, um, a camp for people with disabilities here in, in Montreal um, that was very similar in, in its structure to Camp Jeanette, um, sort of a big house, right? Uh, that was sort of in a, about an hour away from the city. Um, and one of the things that, that I think was the most powerful about that environment um, was that everyone could reach, could just be themselves, and including you know people with or without disabilities, right? That it was just this very celebratory, accepting space. And what I think often gets kind of lost from my perspective in a lot of these conversations about disability rights is that a lot of this is just the right to connect, right? It's just the right to exist. It's just the right to um, you know, the isolation and the social uh, ramifications of that, the emotional and social ramifications of laws that say, you can't go to school where everyone else goes to school. You can't go to work where everyone else goes to work. You can't live where everyone else uh, lives, right? Those are relics. <laughs> they're not even relics. They're, they're, they, they still make up so much of the way that um, people with disabilities are forced to, to overcome um, that, that ableism is, is so institutionalized. Um, so yeah, I'm curious how that, does that resonate with what you were finding throughout the film, like watching all this footage? Because there's so much amazing footage of Camp Jeanette, just truly, it reminds me of like, uh, you know, when you're just kind of, you, you're that one person like constantly filming and people are like, okay, like whatever, but it's gold. Like, like, like to look at all of this footage, you must have I'm, I'm curious how you got your hands on the footage, like who took all of this, um, <laughs> this footage and, and yeah, what did you, where, what was the starting point before you watched the footage? And then was there like an evolution of how you understood the whole thing? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the footage came to us because Jim, you know, as we were talking about casting actors and recreating scenes of the camp. Jim said, well, you might want to check into this thing. There was this radical video coalition that stopped by the camp one summer. And I remember they gave me a camera and they strapped, it was early black and white half inch video. They strapped the porta pack, you know, the recorder onto the back of my wheelchair and handed me the camera. And I filmed a tour of the camp. And I was like, excuse me, (laughs) you actually filmed footage of this camp that we're like planning to, you know, cast actors and recreate. And so uh, I just worked and worked and worked to try to find it. I was like, if it, if it ever existed and was out there and I can find the people, I'll find it. And at one point I was looking at this recently digitized, you know, video activist magazine. And I'm literally like flipping through the pages. I get to the very last page and there's this tiny little ad and it said, Crabs outbreak at Camp Jeanette for the handicapped by the People's Video Theater, 695. <laughs> So they had make, made a little short video just about the crabs outbreak and they were selling it. And that gave me their name. And then I could find out the names of who had been in that coalition. Wow. And I found this guy, Howard Gutstadt, who lived literally like three miles from us. And he had five and a half hours of footage in his basement. And he had applied for a grant uh, from the National Endowment for the Humanities to digitize it. So they needed the rest of the money to pay for the digitization. And we raised some money, partnered with them and get this hard drive that is just like, takes us back to Camp Jeanette. And we didn't know, like, was Jim's tour on it? Was Judy in it? Would, you know, was was Larry the camp director in it? Was there audio? Would the quality hold up, you know? So kind of going back in time and actually being at Camp Jeanette and seeing, being able to observe through the footage kind of exactly what you just spoke to, which is the how the kind of fabric of people kind of coming together and bonding with each other and listening to each other and talking mm-hmm. was what 
made Jeanette so incredible mm -hmm. did shift our, we, I, I would say we did come to understand what the key themes of the film were from that footage, you know? Mm -hmm. And we decided that that scene where Nancy Rosenblum, a young uh, camper with disability affected speech is speaking and everyone's listening to her. And then, you know, her words are translated by another camper. We decided that that scene was to us kind of the penultimate demonstration of what a community like that yeah. can be. And, and that we would sort of try to locate that as kind of the turning point outwards into kind of the political world, right? And that the camp would be kind of this utopian bubble that we would try to bring the viewer into and immerse them in so that if they were coming in as a non-disabled person with sort of ableist preconceptions, that they would go through a kind of an immersive journey in which they would come to understand for themselves that they had those preconceptions and biases, you know, and they would start to break down. And our goal was that by the time you get to that scene with Nancy, that you feel like you're sitting around the table with everybody too. And that, you know, you know and that you feel like that's your, your people. So then when you go into the historical piece, you're coming to it like, these are my people. This is the amazing thing they did instead of seeing it as like this nice story about disability history, which is I think how we've seen yeah. disability history, if we've seen it at all, it's like, well, that's a nice thing that those people did for themselves, you know? But we don't see it as part of our, our larger story. And that's what we were trying to change. So powerful. Um, yeah, the, and, and uh, I think Rebecca Coakley says this, she's a great uh, disability rights, uh, everything activist and and policy wonk uh but yeah she says you know people with disabilities are have been the most creative activists in history like we have to overcome uh you know she, she says we have to overcome so much in order to just exist in order to just be alive and so um can you tell us about 504 this and, and sort of again most people it's not even in the lexicon of of laws that are again taught in school or in american history so um yeah what was why was that so meaningful and and what effect has it had you know how different is the world now because of that sit-in and that activism yeah so disability, early disability, you know, activists like, like Judy were able to work with people on the Hill to insert language into a rehabilitation act during the Nixon administration um, in 73, that was very radical civil rights language that was actually borrowed from the 1964 civil, civil rights legislation. And it basically said that if any, any activity that had a drop of federal money in it, so from public schools to, you know, public transportation to anything, museums, whatever, if you had any federal money in your, in your endeavor, you could not discriminate against people with disabilities. And that was fought for by, you know, with extremely creative strategies, including like um, banding together with Vietnam veterans, you know, um, taking advantage of that kind of like increasing power of uh, the public's attention on um, the lives and kind of, you know, um, rights and needs of people who are coming back uh, from the Vietnam War disabled, um, you know, jamming up streets in New York City, like really, um, when you think when you do think about it like that, you know, we show in the Madison Avenue demonstration where they they stopped traffic in New York, and it was just like 30 people out in the streets. And and that's amazing in and of itself. But when you really know, like when you think about the fact that there was no transportation in New York and like for every single person just to even get there and for the word to get out and all of that, like how, how that was made possible, it's really phenomenal. And, and um, the, just to interrupt, cause I think one that's one of the powerful parts of the film is that you realize it was totally legal to, to not, there, there's just no transportation for people with disabilities. There, you yeah. know, there was no adjustments for, you know, in buses or trains or uh, taxis. So uh, there's a an amazing, you know, part of the film where you see them being, I think, put into a truck or, or the back of a van no. or something like that, mm -hmm. where they're all, you know, traveling um, in this pretty precarious uh, situation. So, so before, I mean, that's what just the the basics that they were fighting for, right? Yeah. It just gives you a sense. It's really true. Um, 
a, a lot of people we interviewed appreciated the sort of irony that um, police vans were not accessible either. And so arresting the demonstrators was not practical at all. And that has changed, you know? I mean, some of the things that we see happening in the film, the demonstrations today, folks would just be arrested and put into mm -hmm. vans that are now accessible. But at the time, mm -hmm. nobody knew. <laughs> You know how to how to how to arrest a, um, a disabled demonstrator. So, um, so yeah, you know, eventually, two presidential administrations later, um, you know, there was this epic uh, sit-in that was actually um, part of kind of a national day of demonstration and takeover of federal buildings at the um, Housing, Education, and Welfare um, offices. Um, all over the country with a lot of different groups, including like deaf activists out of Gal Udet and, um, and uh, um, uh, activists in Chicago. And I mean, it was, it was, it was an epic uh, effort. And San Francisco was the place where the, um, the takeover went on for um, a really long time, almost a month. Um, people occupied this federal building and, um, and eventually, you know, that forced um, the Carter administration to enact 504 legislation, which is um, still a really, really critical um, piece of, um, of law that many, many people benefit from today. Mm -hmm. And it's and like, the foundation of what, the ADA. Sorry. Right. It, it, yeah. It, it, I was going to say it kind of, you know, essentially paved the way for the Americans with Disability Act um, today. Um, so, oh my God, I have so many questions so first of all just because I want to know so how do you go from you know having this idea uncovering this footage to then getting uh President Obama and Michelle Obama ex as executive producers if anyone wants to go that route um how would you suggest that they go about it <laughs> oh I mean when I look back and on on that story and I still I feel on some level that Jim and I still don't fully believe that that actually happened, even though it happened. <laughs> um, because, you know, when we started out, we were like a couple of independent filmmakers with some footage of some teenagers, you know, catching the crabs at a ramshackle summer camp in upstate New York. And we had this dream that it could be a big, important film, but um, it was sort of as it started coming together and attracting attention from the Sundance Institute, we were invited to a lab there and we started to have some conversations with them, um, you know, different streaming platforms and stuff. And we realized that there really was interest in the story and that people, that people were kind of able to envision the importance of what we were doing. Um, we got an executive producer on board um, named Howard Gertler, who's fantastic. And he read in the trades that the Obamas were starting a production company in partnership with Netflix, Higher Ground. Mm -hmm. And um, he immediately said, oh, we, you know, we have to find some way to tell them about what we're doing because mm -hmm. Judy Human worked in President Obama's, you know, State Department. Um, and we felt that there were so many kind of similar um, shared values um, between, you know, what they represent and the work of their foundation mm -hmm. and our project, you know, this idea that young people can um, change the world, um, the importance of grassroots organizing. Um, and so we were able to track down Priya Swami Nathan, who had just been hired to run Higher Ground at the Toronto Film Festival and said, please, 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 will you watch this fundraising trailer? And she said, well, we don't really know what we're doing yet as a company. We're trying to figure out our, our mission and what we're looking to do. And but I'll try to take a look at it if I can. And then she called back and said, you know, we can't stop watching this, um, you know, and, and my bosses feel the same way. And she flew up to uh, the Bay Area and spent a day with Jim and I looking through all the footage and talking to us about our vision. And she said, um, I think you guys have a culture changing project. And I think this is the kind of thing that Higher Ground wants to do. And um, and, you know, we'd like to roll up our sleeves and make the film with you. And at that point, we didn't even really have an assembly together. Um, so it was very early on mm. and they really did partner with us. Um, they watched several cuts of the film and gave feedback. Mm. Um, they were very involved in like the strategy discussions around our impact campaign and how we tried to, you know, um, leverage the film to support the movement of today. And um, it's just, it's been an incredible partnership and we, we know that like 
having access to that platform and having their vote of confidence in the importance of the story has just made an enormous difference, you know? Yeah, that's so cool. Uh, and, and yeah, it is a culture changing film. I mean, that almost feels like an understatement at this point. Um, and and uh, I, I, it really can't be overstated just how few and far between our stories about disability um, in, in Hollywood, right? That, that these projects, um, even as a journalist uh, on a very small, you know, scale, uh, when even I've struggled to get these stories covered and to get a sign off from an editor, because there's this idea, right, that people don't really care about disabilities, that people don't really want to read about it. Uh, you know, go, you, you've heard probably every excuse in the, in the bag, right? Like, it's too sad. People don't want to be depressed or, you know, and, and it's such a limited understanding of, of it really shows how, how, yeah, far we have left to go, but, you know, Crip Camp and, and I know even your journey to the Oscars and your journey to, to getting that nomination and then going to the Oscars, you've, you've changed the Academy Awards, hopefully forever. Um, I, I feel like we can uh, trust in that. I'm a glass half full kind of person. And uh, this year's uh, Oscars, if, if, if anyone um, didn't watch, it, it, it was just a, a true, uh, I think watershed moment in in disability representation at, at an award show where where I mean the last time there was a I mean it, it just not only do we not see um, stories about disability um, represented but we often when we do they are roles that are being played by people without disabilities um, which is kind of like blackface for disability I think we need a, a kind of term for it because it's um, still widely accepted to see non-disabled actors um, perform disability and that very often they get Oscars for that. So mm -hmm. it, it makes you more likely to get a, an Academy Award or to be nominated mm -hmm. if you are uh, performing uh, disability. So I'm just, you know, I, I wanna sort of congratulate you and thank you uh, because I know it, it was not easy to reform an industry um, in, in, you know, sort of the way I see it is like you were on the train and you had to like create the train tracks as you were going because <laughs> it, you know, I, I know we talked about this, but maybe you can share just how even the, you know, there's the Oscars, there's a stage that doesn't have uh, a, a that, that hasn't been accessible pretty much ever. But then you also have the parties, you have the networking, you have all of the extra little events that very often are not accessible at all. And so can you speak a little bit about how the movie it, it has already started reforming the industry? Yeah, I mean, Jim and I often talk about it like the project was like a like a literal icebreaker, like going, cutting through the ice and hopefully paving a path for other filmmakers and other projects and other narratives. Cause you know, there was so much pressure on this film because it was going to be a film that had this Netflix and higher ground platform mm -hmm. representing, as you say, the disability community in a way that it really never is on such a large cultural scale, right? If there are disabled people in films or in storytelling or whatever, it's usually one person, not multiple people. And it's usually one kind of disability, not many. So this was very unique and there was a huge amount of pressure, I think, to kind of like, well, make sure you include this and make sure you include that. And yet we had chosen uh, to tell the story from the point of view of this you know, group of friends and, um, because we felt that was a way to make it kind of universally accessible and for people to um, really emotionally connect to it. Um, and those friends happen to be, you know, a group of largely white people, for instance, you know, so we felt really passionately from the beginning that one of our jobs here was to try to pave the way for other, other perspectives, other stories, other filmmakers, you know, all the way through. And we knew that because of like my career and track record in gyms, we had access to things like say, people at the Sundance Institute. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we were gonna go even in the early stages of our project, you know, to go pitching and, and fundraising, we were making sure like if we get there and you're holding a party in an inaccessible venue, we're gonna kind of get in your face and let you know that that's not okay, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, 
And it was really interesting because a lot of people that Jim had been saying, hey, that's not accessible to for years, when the two of us came as directors and said, uh, one director is able to get into your party, but the other one can't, it was a totally different thing and people couldn't say no to us. So we had, um, you know, rustic retreats for filmmakers that we were invited to um, while we were editing, you know, that had to reckon with building ramps and making things accessible. And then over time, a lot of these people became real partners with us in creating change. Um, so, you know, a couple of years later, Sundance is hosting a lab for disabled filmmakers from all over the world and bringing them in. And we had this incredible, you know, um, event. And some of those films are now starting to come out. Um, with the Academy, you know, Jim has been an Academy member for a number of years and I became one this year. And, um, and so the conversation has been going on for a long time. And it's funny, but I remember at Sundance when our film premiered, we went to an Academy party and I remember walking in and overhearing Jim say, now you better get a ramp to the stage, you know, next year, um, kind of because, you know, you're going to be nominated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and even with Sundance, you know, he yeah. was having literally to, to go to Sundance and say, you know, I hope there's a ramp to the stage in case we win an award. And we did win the audience award. And it was only because he went over there the night before that there was there was a ramp. And it's not, I mean, once he brought it to people's attention, people were great. Yeah. Um, but it's just that the fact of kind of doing something like that for the first time that was so transformational. And this year they built, not only did they build a ramp to the Oscar stage, but they built it in this beautiful kind of universal design fashion so that every single person um, who went on up onto the stage walked up it because Jim said, now, if you're going to put a ramp there, you can't put some ramp off to the side where if Nicole and I go up there, which we didn't because we didn't win. But if we had, you know, what we were trying to avoid was a situation where you know, I walk up the way everybody else had walked up yeah. and he's having to go over to the side and then join me, you know, totally. and they really, they really understood that. And they, they came up with a gorgeous design, which to your earlier point is like, it's just the right best thing to do for everybody. You know, it's not yeah. a, some special. Yeah. Accessibility is gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's like universal design is, you know, for, for people who may not be familiar, you know, is, this um, approach to architecture that you just create buildings and and you know uh, stair you know environments really uh, with people you know, that are accessible to everybody and that obviously are uh, that no matter what disability you have you can still use them and usually those buildings are just the best buildings you've been in like if you think about the I you, you know uh, did, did a program at LSC and I remember there was this like gorgeous building that I just loved being in and I just felt good when I was there and I'd go and study there and when I thought back at all of the sort of points that are included in universal, universal design, I realized, oh, wow, that was why I felt so great in that, in that building. And I don't have a disability, but um, so creating spaces um, with everyone in mind, just create better spaces. Um, so you're totally right. I wanna remind everyone, we're, we're just about to hit questions um, soon. So please um, flood the chat, just in the chat. I'm sure you have many because we've, um, I, ha I had a lot of points. I've covered like two out of 14 um, that, that I had. And, um, but I guess I wanna end um, on a question, hopefully that's helpful to people in the audience. And I'm even curious, it's, it's also for me because it's something I think a lot about as a uh, producer and, and just uh, creator, I, I, I guess, is how do we get especially as uh, for people who may not have disabilities, but want to amplify these uh, stories and, and, and want more stories about and by people with disabilities. How do we um, ensure that those stories get made? Like what's, what would be your advice to, to people, not just as creators, but maybe even as allies um, to, to, to really ensure that equality of, um, of, of, of just the, you know, coverage in, in, in terms of film and TV that, that we have people with disabilities equally represented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when you were talking earlier, I was thinking about, you know, the fact that when we got nominated for an Oscar, 
And we realized Jim was the first visibly disabled director to ever be nominated. And every article that came out about sort of the breakthrough firsts didn't mention that. And then when, when you contacted us, we were so grateful because somebody who was a journalist who understood disability was wanting to cover that fact because there really had not really been anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that is because there just aren't enough disabled writers in the newsroom. So like the Sundance Institute did a great thing where they were providing stipends for disabled journalists to come to the festival and, and cover. But like that just has to increase yeah. a lot, you know? So I think it's like advocating for, um, for that kind of representation the way you would um, anything else, you know? I mean, I've heard people say that, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion should include an A at the end, you know? So it's to, for access. Um, but that that's just anytime you're thinking about DEI initiatives or judging an organization on their equity, make sure that disability is included in their definition of it, you know, is a, is a really key thing. And there's a, um, a really great coalition of folks inside Hollywood called uh, One and Four, um, which is like, you know, disabled people working within the industry trying to change it. And that's the other thing I would say is like, it's important to... Um, yeah, to follow disability-led organizations and and um, and uh, and learn from disabled people, kind of what's what's needed. Um, mm -hmm. Read disabled writers um, it, within the industry. You know, some of the asks are like to make sure that internship programs and um, and fellowships and apprenticeships, you know, are representative, so that um, so that people with disabilities have um, on ramps, so to speak, you know, into those kind of careers. Um, which is really important. And all of that requires kind of culture change, um, I think at the organizational level, you know? Um, so we try to talk a lot about that idea that you wanna have, um, you wanna have a group of people uh, in your organization or on your filmmaking team or whatever that's diverse and includes um, people with disabilities, then you have to have a culture that is just kind of um, accepting and, um, and really, uh, doesn't make any exceptions around, uh, the accommodations that people are telling you that they need. And, you know, kind of like universal design that turns out to be a better culture for everyone. So we found that by saying like, you know, if somebody with a disability, you know, had a hard time coming in to work before 11 o'clock in the morning, um, that is, is, you know, we would work around that because we wanted that person to be a productive member of our team, then why wouldn't we also work around, you know, somebody else's elder care situation or parental needs, you know, it's yeah. just basically um, creating cultures and environments like that um, so that people with disabilities can bring what they have to bring to the table, which is usually extraordinary. Yeah. And, and that, uh... You know, I think one thing that I, I know my, you know, uh, my friends with disabilities, you know, have, have signaled to me is just like how valuable it is for non-disabled people to ask for those um, accommodations, right? When there is an event, just ask if it's accessible. Like, just be like, oh, is, and it's accessible, you know, <laughs> even kind of asking it that way. So you're like, it's accessible, right? And then have them say, oh, no, actually, we did make it accessible. Um, I, I, I think it's, you know, we talk a lot about checking your privilege. I, I, I prefer invest your privilege, right? Like you have all this extra social capital as a um, non-disabled person um, and, and, and use it, you know, because it's actually really annoying for uh, people with disabilities to constantly be asking for, uh, you know, their basic human rights to be respected. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just encourage, I, I, I know I'm telling that as a reminder for myself because I, I you know, I, I've not asked that enough and it really does make a difference for that culture shift, right? Like you can be Judy human <laughs> and literally change the world and the course of history. Um, but all of us have such a huge role just in our daily lives. And there's so many little things that we can, you know, cho choices that we can make that, um, have a huge ripple effect. Uh, so I just want to encourage everyone to to do what you did, right? Um, when when you were invited to, to places, just point out, you know, the flaws in some of the diversity initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question. Uh, his name is Bo Simon, and I would like Bo to unmute if you want to be on camera. Great. Hi. And ask, can you call your question. 
Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you for being here. Yeah, my name is uh, Bo Simon. I'm a third year um, in the college. And as you spoke about a little bit earlier, uh, Crip Camp really is sort of like an icebreaker film. Um, and that's because like it, it's so incredibly engaging uh, for such a broad audience. So I'm curious, Nicole, if you could talk a little bit about the creative decisions that went into sort of balancing, um, you know, centering disabled people while also ensuring that Crip Camp had a mainstream audience. Um, and had mainstream appeal uh, to make sure that it had that sort of impact? That's a great question. Um, thanks for asking it. You know, um, it, it was really interesting. Uh, sometimes people ask me, sorry about the dog. Sometimes people ask me what was the biggest challenge um, in making the film? And it really was um, people's preconceived notions and biases and how to get around them. And we found that like the tropes that people are used to seeing disability represented in are usually like inspiration porn, you know, or kind of tragedy porn. So the disabled person is there either to make a non-disabled person feel inspired by how they overcame their challenges or, you know, we're kind of like watching, um, you know, something that we're thinking like, oh, thank God, I don't have to deal with that in my life, you know, and um these are incredibly damaging, unhealthy tropes, but it's literally almost all we ever see. And so one of the challenges we faced and we started to see it when we were screening rough cuts of our film was that despite sometimes our best intentions, people were reading things that we were putting into the film in those two things. I started to think about it like tractor ruts that people's brains just kind of go into because it's, it's what they're expecting. And so we, we had to figure out how to artistically make the film in such a ways that we were getting around that. And one of the ways we did it was through humor. Um, we, we constantly had to have humor. And another thing was emotional complexity. So we couldn't have something be just sad um, or just wonderful, you know? We, we were often going for that kind of like um, multi-layered thing where you were kind of like laughing through your tears, you know? Um, and, and those were some of the ways that we found that people were kind of thrown off enough that they would um, open themselves up to what they were actually watching instead of just seeing it through the bias that they were coming to it with, you know, if that makes sense. And so, so that's why we felt really strongly that we didn't wanna give away where the film was headed um, until the end, because we wanted people to come to it with a changed way of looking at the world. And we faced some resistance around that because there was this sort of idea that like, oh, well, why are people going to want to bother to spend time in this camp if they don't know this great thing is going to happen at the end? And people were saying, well, you should start with the ADA and go backwards in time. And, um, and we really, um, we did actually try that at one point. And it was totally horrible <laughs> for the reason that I said before, which was, you know, then, then it sort of seemed like this, like, the kids and their experience at camp and everything was seen through this like, well, isn't that nice for people with disabilities kind of lens when in fact, like we wanted people to relate to the camp experience. Like it's just a camp experience. It's like everybody can relate to going to camp for the first time and falling in love for the first time and, you know, making out behind, you know, the, the cabin for the first time and all of that. And so, um, you know, there were, um, there were lots of decisions that were made um, in order to try to like um, constantly take the non-disabled person and throw them back on their heels and surprise them and make them aware of their own um, prejudice. And then also kind of take them by the hand and pull them into the next scene. Like, okay, you're a kind of a member of this group now, you know? Um, and then, I mean, and then we also tried to kind of build in characters like towards the end of the story like Holland DeLille who, you know, acquired her disability later on in life and found, you know, she, she found uh, self-esteem and kind of her feminist identity through the 504 sit-in um, and kind of meaning to her life, you know, beyond um, just disability rights. Um, so we're trying to kind of also give non-disabled people and a broad audience like pathways into understanding like that we're all basically temporarily um, non-disabled, you know, and um, and that this is just like, the disability is sort of a part of the normal spectrum of human existence, you know? Yeah, that's amazing, thank you.
So powerful. Such a great question, Bo. And such a, I'm just sitting with your answer because it's so true that it's tragedy or right at aspirational, right? Yeah. And there's to, to, to actually explore the nuance and, and to flip it, to go, you know, oh yeah, this is kind of sad, but then also, oh, to really add nuance to that, I think is so smart and that you're anticipating the non-disabled viewers ableism, <laughs> and, right? Like, or lens, I guess, and uh, flipping it on its head. I think it's so powerful, so smart. Um, <laughs> It's brilliant. Uh, so we have a, a question from YouTube because this is on YouTube. We're, we're everywhere. We're on Zoom, <laughs> we're Zooming, we're YouTubing. Um, from Duke Best, um, who you know uh, says that years ago I, I uh, did a story for Vox about the accessibility ch- accessibility challenges that exist when simply trying to vote. Um, so Duke is asking, has ballot accessibility improved and what is the next big challenge to address? So I don't know if you have any thoughts uh, about that, Nicole. I, I don't think I'm, yeah, I don't think I'm, I'm qualified to answer that question, but I do think it's a really, a really, really important one. And it's one that, you know, we, we definitely, um, tried to use Crip Camp to kind of bring people together around in the last election, you know, and I think that's probably a really great, um, a a great issue for when you were talking earlier about what allies can do, you know, that's Mm -hmm. something we can definitely do um, is, is make sure that, I mean, and, you know, I think all the time when I'm reading about voter suppression efforts that are happening right now about how they would particularly impact, you know, people with disabilities, um, that's just been a really, it's been really interesting to have this film come out in the time of the pandemic and in the time of you know Black Lives Matter movement and to see all the ways in which um, a lot of a lot of these issues are disproportionately impacting um, disabled people, you know. Yeah. Truly, I I, I uh, totally agree. I, I think the the again we need film, uh, we need representation of, of of people with disabilities because that is one of the key it's a, it's almost, it's like a vicious cycle, right? So there is no representation or not enough. And so politicians then don't view people with disabilities as a voting uh, block or or demographic, right? When they make up 20% of the population, they're, they're a huge force of nature um, in, in, in terms of voting. And they're very much untapped still because of all of this ableism and, and the issues with not just voter suppression, but just generally the lack of, of, of access to, to voting. So, I, but, but I will say, I, I think I did that report in 2016 and, you know, in addition to it being a presidential election with a uh, leader who ended up winning, who was, I believe, probably the most openly ableist uh, president ever. Um, and, and so there was that additional, I think, um, that felt like an additional catalyst that then woke up, uh, I think, especially the Democratic Party uh, that had, you know, one of the most accessible conventions ever. There was the Women's March that was the largest gathering of people with disabilities Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. in American history. Um, So there have been a lot, there's been, and and then uh, if you even look at the 2020 um, election and and particularly when it came to just the Democratic primary, there were, I believe a million people running. Uh, I can't remember the exact amount, but it was a whole baseball team. Um, And and every single presidential candidate on the democratic side uh, had a website that was accessible. And if you can believe that was not at all the norm uh, before 2020, it was was actually uh, there, there, I think Hillary Clinton may have been the the only one that had a disability platform and, and had um, actually, you know, was, uh, was, I think one of the most invested presidential candidates in, in probably American history in, in disability rights. So, um, so it has, it has gotten better. And, and we know that Joe Biden even mentioned, uh, disability at his, um, during his acceptance speech when he won the, um, the presidential race this year or last year. And, and again, these are small, 
very not they're not small they're basic human rights right to mention disability when you're listing all of the different you know people that make up america it seems like a no-brainer but this was the first time so yeah. um I, I think we are seeing seeing uh, a, a real positive shift and and crip camp is certainly um a huge part of this and and highlighting just the how how better the world is and how better America is because of people with disabilities within America that fought for everybody. So um, I want to ask one last question, I, I think, because I know we're wrapping up soon, from Steve, um, who did the intro to the event. He has a burning question. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was curious, there's so many wonderful moments uh, and amazing moments throughout the film. Were there any important concepts or ideas that you and Jim thought that most viewers miss or sometimes overlook because there's so many cool things and amazing things happening throughout the film? Points that things that are in the film, but that we find audiences might not fully grasp. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I, um, it's a, that's, that's a completely new question to me. Um, I, you know, I think that, um, that there are definitely, um, there are definitely things that some people get and some people don't, you know, um, and it's always sort of surprising to me. Um, you know, I think, um, one of the things that I think we tried to show throughout the film that maybe people do miss a little bit is the sort of, um, the role of the, the role of the media and how they cover disability in, um, in how disability rights has advanced or has struggled to advance, you know, over time. And one of the things that we were really fascinated by was the idea that through the people's video theater footage, we could introduce you to this group of folks and then we could start seeing those people as they were perceived in the media, you know? So it's interesting to me, to us, it was totally fascinating, like how the language shifted across time, you know, um, that you, you, you start hearing people use, um, you know, people first language and, and the word disability, you know, at a certain point in the film, whereas earlier in the film, people are saying handicapped and things like that, you know, um, and, you know, by the same token, like there's, there's questions that interviewers are asking and some of the news clips that are in the film that are like a little bit cringy and things like that. And I, I've been, I was hoping people would sort of um, dissect that a little bit on their own, you know, and I think, I think sometimes people will, will, will come to us and say like, well, what word should we use, <laughs> you know, and I think, I, I guess I've just sort of realized that it's hard to have that kind of like meta analysis about how the media looks at disability if you're kind of haven't really ever thought about disability as an identity or culture at all, you know. Um, but my, my hope is that the film will be read really differently by people, you know, even in five years than it is now, you know, and that it's just sort of the beginning of kind of shifting, um, like giving people a groundwork to start having a way of looking at disability that um, is more a rights-based way of looking at it. Thank you. That makes so total much. sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question, Stephen. Um, we are running short, but I do have a, a good, it's a very important question. So uh, if you mind sticking around for more minutes, um, we have a question from Claire Capehart, who says, um, how over the course of creating the film, how did you take, did y'all take, I, I'm Canadian, so my y'all is not great. Uh, did y'all <laughs> take into account the intersectional identities of the people featured in crip camps and disability issues can affect people differently depending on gender, race, socioeconomic background? Yeah, I think we did a bit, um, but I think that there's so much room for, for further exploration of that, you know? Um, I mean, for instance, like we we definitely did try to highlight the sort of um, coalition building and kind of like cross movement building across different identity groups and the 504, for instance, um, and how people came together. But I think because we were trying to make that larger point of the, the power of people coming together across difference. And again, because like a lot of our characters were were a group of, you know, white, you know, cisgendered mostly people. Um, there was, 
I, I think that there's a lot of, a lot more room. Like I had, a, I had a friend, um, honestly say to me, like, I really would have liked to see explored, like for, for say like the, you know, the black activists who are featured in the film, like, what's it like to be black and disabled, you know? And I don't, I don't think that that's a strength of, of how we chose to tell this story. I think that, that that's, those are really important things to look at. Um, and again, I think just because um, we were trying to focused on trying to, to show the power of this coalition and how it came together. Um, that was not really the focus of the film, but I think you do see it in other ways around, around gender, um, you know, um, you definitely are around sexuality to a certain extent, you know, what's it like to be a woman who's experiencing discrimination by a doctor, you know, and kind of suffering ableism and, you know, sexism at the same time. Some of the stories really do start to unpack some of some of those multiple identities. Yeah. And, and, you know, that shot of Judy Human being like, I would appreciate if you stopped nodding when when you're not actually understanding what I'm saying, like you're you're, yeah. you're not listening to me. Right. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really, really powerful moment. And um, and, 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 and yeah, I, 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 I think I mean, disability is intrinsically related to to police brutality, to right what we often, um, you know, think it's obviously a. a, a a racial inequality issue, but but half of people who do end up being, um, you know, brutalized by, by the police have disabilities, right? So there are a lot of activists, um, black black activists with, with disabilities. I'm thinking of Imani Barberin. Uh, she's a great follow on TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter. She's everywhere at Crutches and Spice. And she, um, yeah, is, is, is such a great, uh, voice uh, and, and really talk so much about that that intersection which um is is, is not uh discussed enough but um yeah i i just want to throw in one one last thing which is actually that you know for because of that actually because of that very issue um we chose to locate our uh impact campaign within the disability justice movement which prioritizes sort of the perspectives and leadership of people of color and, and yeah. queer folks within the disability community and they have developed, um, Andrea Levon and Stacey Park Milburn designed our campaign and there's an incredible team behind it. And, um, and uh, uh, so that's why I'm saying they, because <laughs> I want to say we, but really they, they did it all, designed this incredible um, uh, um, study guide that's actually specifically focused on sort of using Crip Camp as a jumping off point for looking at things from a disability justice perspective. And that's all um, available on, on our website at cripcamp.com. So um, if you're interested in exploring that, um, it's it's a really incredible resource, um, as well as this sort of virtual experience that um, that was run all summer long, um, that was kind of uh, doing capacity building within the movement and um, highlighting wisdom and perspectives of, of people um, who uh, sometimes don't get a big enough platform for, for their work and some really, really incredible people. So um, I encourage folks to check that out too. Yeah, you worked with a team of rock stars. Um, pretty much every cool person I, I or cool person I follow in you know disability Twitter and they're like, oh yeah, I worked on the film. I was like, oh my god. Uh, so I <laughs> you, truly and the, the shot of you and a Andrea Levon and at the Oscars is just like I want to frame it. Uh, I, I want it to be a <laughs> wallpaper. Literally, like one frame is not enough. It just shows you how impactful the film is and and how impactful. Um, you just just how big the changes that 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 you have just incurred in, in with this one film. So uh, we are so thankful uh, that you exist. We're so thankful that you made this film. We're excited to see all of the next things that uh, you have in store for us. And um, thank you to everyone who asked really uh, insightful questions and and yeah, super engaging conversation. Um, thank you so much to everybody. Thanks, Liz. Bye. -bye.